welcome everybody. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, we have Doc Detloff here, and he's going to explain about New Holland and um, New Zealand, I meant, <laughs> and Holland and H2H and Milk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I like these small quality crowds. I see a lot of intellect out here. So anyway, um, I've had the good fortune after I wore out and left practice to do some traveling around the world. Organic Valley sent me to Holland. And uh, Dr. Paul's, we have a distributorship in New Zealand. And I've been there four times, and I think you were along three times. And, and uh, so I'm finding that daring in other countries is completely different, United States, totally different. And there's a lot of things we can learn from it. So um, we'll see. I do have a little summary here, quick, I want to go over to show you the magnitude of dairy in the world. The U.S. has 9 million cows. In fact, it just dropped under 8.9 million dairy cows, 5.5 million beef cows. In 1942, the year I was born, there were 26 million cows in America. These 9 million give as much milk as the 26 million because everybody had a house cow. Everybody had a, had a, for the horses and that. It was even higher at the turn of the century, and I couldn't find that. California right now is dropping. They're at 1.39 million, and the dairy industry of California is over. There's so many regulations in the San Joaquin Valley for their aquifer. Uh, Organic Valley had a pool in San Joaquin Valley. I was out there a lot. And to produce milk in California, it's just, it just doesn't happen. It's, you're going to see Wisconsin is up to 1.25 million. When I went to vet school in 1967, Wisconsin was number one. Minnesota was number two. California is very low. Uh, now we've got dairy in places like Idaho, Texas, New Mexico. You're going to see animal agriculture in the next two, three decades is going to move back into the Midwest. As we speak today, the state of Missouri is being bought up by the Amish. They are coming in droves because it's cheaper land and they know how to graze. They are grass farmers. And they'll come in and they'll buy in a, it's called a sect. 30 families has a church. And no physical church. They have a, a wagon that's got chairs and tables. It's called the church wagon. And if you're going to have church next Sunday, today's Thursday, you'll get, get the church wagon. And you'll see when the Amish come into a community, if they have a 30 by 30 house, they'll add 30 feet onto it. So it's 60 by 30, and they either have a huge living room or a huge basement, or they got a woodworking shop or something, because they have to have church every so often. When it gets to be 30 people, then they put up another group, another sect. The younger ones will split off. They're very democratic. There's an uh, Amish group in northern Michigan that have tractors, big tractors. They voted on it. The group in Blair went through some turmoil. When I came, there were 22 farms in 67 that were milking by hand. And as the price of land went up, and Carl knows that as a banker, uh, these guys couldn't afford to buy land at six or seven cows milking by hand. So the younger group outvoted the old group, and they formed their own church with the more liberal so they could have generators and electricity. Way over half of the organic milk in America is produced by Amish and Mennonites. And they are true stewards of the soil. They do not sue anybody. They pay their bills. You can ask my wife. We ran Dr. Paul's for years. And we just didn't have any write-offs from the Amish. They are so honest. And they have common sense. And they're expanding. They have lots of children. And so they're all laborers in that. New Zealand has 5.5 million cows with a population now that is over 5 million. It was 4.5 million when we started going there. And they have retirees from Britain that are coming down because they've got San Diego weather in these two islands. And so Australia only has 1.5 million with 26 million people. 
Uh, Holland, they've got 17 million people with 1.8 million. Uh, China has 8.7 million, but they have 1.4 billion people. India has 1.3 billion. The cows are sacred there. They don't uh, in India. Um, in November 15th, 2022, the world population hit 8, million, 8 billion. We hit 8 billion. Uh, the world is looking at a protein shortage, and that's meat, milk, dairy, fish, and chicken. The animal fats are back in. The, there's a book that came out called The Big Fat Challenge by Nina T. Colts about three years ago, and she researched cholesterol. We're the only country on the planet that treats cholesterol. We were sold by a bill of goods by a guy named Keyes, an MD on Key, his Ansel Keyes, did a test on 12 people that they cannot repeat, and nobody else has used this cholesterol medicine. You're supposed to have a number of 100 plus however old you are. I should be 181 in cholesterol, and they don't want that. And so uh, animal fat has is, is come back in. Uh, we had, in 1884, 30 million buffalo. And they estimate that way back in the 17, late 1700s, there was close to 60 million buffalo. So when the politicians say we should get rid of cattle because they're burping up methane, and we only have 5.5, and we got, uh, we got 8.9, 8 .8 but 5.5 beef cattle, so we don't have, methane is not an issue from our dairy cows. And the grass-fed dairy cows do not produce much methane. It's the corn, corn, corn. The rumen is not made for seeds. You know what seeds are made for? Right. Poultry, and, and poultry and, uh, and pigs, monogastrics. So, okay, if anybody wants to take a picture of that later, we'll leave it there. I'm going to move fairly fast because I've got a lot of things to talk about. New Zealand is two islands, North Island, South Island, two islands of grass. There's mountains down in here. This is where that movie, what movie am I talking about? Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is down here by Queenstown. This is very, very, very beautiful. There's no litter in New Zealand. They had a prime minister 15 years ago that said, let's clean up Kiwi land. And if I see you throw something out of the window, I'm gonna write down your license number and I'm gonna call in. I'm gonna say, that car ahead of me just threw out a Mountain Dew can. And you will get a call and they'll say, we have evidence you did this, don't you ever do it again. They'll give you one chance. If not, there's a heavy fine. And we were amazed, weren't we, honey, when we were over there, there's just no litter. The other thing is that they don't grow corn. They don't grow corn. They don't allow glyphosate. And so how do they make things sweet? With honey, cane sugar, lots of honey. There's beehives all over. When you don't have a side over there, you're not screwing up the, the bee. And so, very interesting. Next slide, honey. We're gonna get bigger, yeah. Here's Auckland up here. Uh, North Island, South Island. There's about as many cattle on each island. And say this is more mountainous. Okay, next one. This is our dealer over there. We're in Auckland. Phyllis, very powerful lady, very, very organic, very intelligent. Next slide. Here's Auckland. A million people in Auckland. Next one. You'll see that. Fonterra is the only dairy co-op in Australia and New Zealand. About 13, 14 years ago, Fonterra kept growing, growing. It's a farm co-op, and there were a few little ones left. And the government said, you know what, you're really inefficient, and you are too, and you are too. We're going to eliminate you. There's only going to be one co-op. It's going to be Fonterra. You're all Fonterra. 
when you have a monopoly, you become arrogant dictatorship. And so what they say goes. They control the harbors. They control the imports and exports to the dairy products over there. And the, the farmer in general does not like the authoritative attitude they have. So you'll see these signs because they use chemicals and the people want to be natural. Next slide. Here's, uh, these are jerseys, a lot of jerseys, and we'll talk about them later. These are two brothers, and I had a barn meeting there. Uh, I went over there and I would put these meetings on all around. And, uh, uh, and it's all grass, and you can see there's a hedge back here. They've got miles and miles of manicured hedges. And these cattle in New Zealand and in, in Holland are so tame. I mean, they, you'd be in the pasture and they'll walk up to you and lick your leg in that. I mean, it's just, it was always amazing. Next slide. Next slide. I'm talking on something. Here's a tray top. They don't have pickups. They got little tray tops, all tray tops. And a lot of Toyotas, a lot of Mazdas. Next slide. Another one, that's a Mazda. Here's a classroom. Um, they do not have corporate America that puts on seed meetings or fertilizer meetings or machinery meetings. It will give you a sweatshirt and you get a pair of ball, baseball cap and a jackknife and they get a nice meal. And so corporate America furnishes all the meals. They don't exist over there. So when you go to put on a meeting, if you don't charge, nobody comes. When I went over there with Arden Anderson the first time, he talked one day on human health. I talked the next day on cattle health, and we both talked soils. And we charged like 500 bucks for the two days, and it's BYO, bring your own lunch in a brown bag. Okay, it's time <laughs> to eat. Everybody reaches under and gets a brown bag. And they give them water or juice or something, but totally different over there. And you can see the places, oh, we limited it, 100 people. 118 sign up. I thought, why don't we let them 18 in? Nope, 100 people. <laughs> Greedy Detloff, you know, I was born in America. They had some integrity. Next slide. And this is out. I like to do a, I like to get out in the field and dig a hole and look at the cattle. Next slide. Uh, this is a typical, a lot of jerseys. Some of the most beautiful Ayrshires you're ever going to see are over there. Uh, next slide. There's a bull. There's a bull. Did you see this swirl here? This is in the reading of the hair. This is the adrenal swirl. That means that that guy's hormones and, and enzymes and adrenal gland and pituitary gland are functioning well. And if you can, this probably doesn't show on here, but you'll see, yeah, there's happy lines. See that line here? That's a happy line. We'll see more of those, and I'll tell you about those later. Next slide. Grazing, they intensively rotational graze. They'll go out to a paddock, multi-multi-species paddock. Um, there's an old book in 1917 that I ran across that said that you realize the bovine ruminant would like to ingest a hundred different plants every seven days to remain balanced. Some plants have higher manganese, some plants have higher zinc, some plants have higher calcium. And if you can get, take in a hundred different plants, you're gonna take in a whole plethora of the 92 trace elements or at trace elements. It just makes sense. Next slide, and that's, okay, you know what that is? That, yeah, I better put this on here, I'll tip it over. That is narrow leaf plantain. Little patch of it. What is narrow leaf plantain? It's a natural wormer. It's a natural wormer. That and chicory. Next slide. They do so many neat things. Here they all have a they all have a meeting room or meeting hall. The government put these up all over, and that's where I'd have a meeting. Next slide. Okay, here's happy lines, happy lines. Hair coat, beautiful hair coats. When they're on grass, 
they're getting the, the, free, the energy that comes from grass. You talk about energy from corn and that, you're talking uh, protein. Energy from grass is called uh, volatile fatty acids. The best one is acetic acid, it's pure energy. What's that? That's apple cider vinegar. Okay, propionic acid is energy. Butyric acid is not good because that lowers the pH of the rumen. So you want acetic and you want propionic acid, and that's what you're getting out of these plants. Next slide. Here's an Ayrshire, absolutely beautiful. Hey, that's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful cow. The Ayrshires we have in America, I had maybe five herds in my practice. If you want to get kicked, you go into an Ayrshire barn and you let your pail handle go down and that cow behind you will kick you. Ayrshires are just absolutely high strung in America. And this, look at her, that really shines here. She's got this nice glow. Uh, next slide. Okay, a German. Peter Guyon in the 1800s studied cows and he studied hair patterns and he could make predictions on them. I had, when I first started my barn meetings back when I was in practice in uh, 1998, I had a gentleman come from Arkansas and he had gotten a hold of this literature from Peter, uh, I can't, G-U-I-O-N, Guyon. And this is the escutcheon, okay? And this is that Ayrshire cow, and you see how the hair, the hair is going up, and it's silky, and it's silky, and it's coming down, and it's going way out on the thigh. This, this escutcheon hair, it's going way out on the thigh. You know what this is an indication of, and you can tell it on a 10-day-old calf? Butter fat. Butter fat. That cow is probably 6% butter fat. And you can pick that out. Next slide. Here is pregnancy swirl. See this? This cow is about seven months pregnant. Next slide. Here's another one. This cow is probably five months pregnant. This is the pregnancy swirl. Next slide. Another pregnancy swirl. Next slide. Um, they grow grass, so they analyze their pastures and they use the Elbrecht system like our organic people do. Uh, the NPK system is the Van Liebig system. And the Van Liebig system says if you take two ton of alfalfa off here and one percent of it's as calcium, you gotta put that back on. Well, if you had a lot of cattle on that farm, a lot of manure, a lot of urine, you will build up your potassium. And when your potassium level gets much higher than the calcium, that's a veterinarian's dream. You get utter edema, you get difficult calvings, you'll get ketosis, you'll get poor quality colostrum, and these are all veterinarian's dreams. And then the best part is they'll flip their abomasum. And I loved them, I loved John, didn't I? One time I went in John's barn and there was 22 of them in there. I love John. <laughs> Joan would say, I'd come home and she'd say, how many days you do today? Oh, I only, I only had one. Ooh, we got six kids, you know. So, <laughs> anyway, you probably will never come with me again. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm putting on a meeting over, right over here where these Ayrshires are. And this guy goes over on this farm here. And he goes with a little four-wheeler with a little red buggy. And he goes zipping up here. Next slide, honey. And he's coming down. And he just comes down, and he, he didn't come down here. He'd kill himself, but he'd go along here. And, and I, I watched him, and finally I said, what's this neighbor doing? Is he trying to kill himself? No, 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 he's, he's putting gypsum on his pasture. He was liming his pasture with gypsum. See, sulfur, his cal his gypsum is calcium sulfate. And if you get a lot of rain, Anything with a negative charge leaches because our soil has a negative charge. On our planet, all our soil has a negative charge. So what sticks to it? The positives. The positives. And this is what Bob Schmitnick is all about. 
So you balance the positives. You want 75% of the shelving in the soil to have calcium on it. You want 18% of it to have magnesium on it, and you want 5 to 8% with potassium. When you get potassium screaming high from manure and urine, then you got the veterinarian's dream. So the organic world follows the method of, uh, came out of Missouri, help me with the name. Albrecht. Albrecht. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Bob. He's, a, he's an Elbrick. These, these old guys that don't say anything, I sure love them because I learned a lot from them. Uh, him and Bob Smitnick were mentors for years for me. But they pay attention to their soil in New Zealand and in, and in Netherlands too. Next slide. Another meeting hall. Next slide. See all the hedges? See all the hedges? And then you see here, these are trees that they can munch on. They'll have a kind of a herbal hedgerow right here at the end of the hedges, no fences, brown cows, brown cows. They don't need much, they, they, don't, they don't need a lot of physical structure. There's no silos when you don't use corn silage or high moisture corn, it's you store hay in bales. Next slide, and they graze a month. The average size herd in New Zealand is 440 cows. Their milk is less, a lower price than ours, but they, their, their price, their land is ast astronomical. It was like 20,000 acre when I first started going over there. Or in the, but they go by hectare. There's 2.4 acres in a hectare. And so that's storage for 400 and some cows because they got 10 months of summer. So they don't need a lot. Next slide. This company followed me around wherever I'd go. And this was a soils company. And this is a foliar spray company. We'll get into foliar spray, which is happening in America today. I've witnessed it when I started doing consulting for a company in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It was a big Amish company that went, the Amish went organic out east really quick. And they wanted some veterinary tools. So Dr. Pauls had a new dealership out there in, in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and over half his business was foliar spray because this would have been 25 years ago, Joan, I bet. Mm -hmm. And their land was 18, 20,000 an acre then. And these little 55 acre farms with 40 cows and 12 horses and 10 kids made a living on it. And so they paid attention. And you increase the nutrient density. What you do when you foliar spray, you put all everything that will be metabolized to grow a plant. You got to have sugar. You got to have protein. You got to have uh, a whole list of stuff. And they would mix this up and they'd spray it after the dew is off and the sunshine and it speeds up photosynthesis. And they found out if you put apple cider vinegar in it, it opens up the stomata on the bottom of a leaf so it really photosynthesizes. The stomata is what controls the, the growth of a plant. They don't have a heart to beat. So the faster you can bring CO2 in and give off oxygen, the faster the plant grows. And so apple cider vinegar stimulates the little modal cilia that are around the stomata to dilate. And so that day that plant really chugs along photosynthesizing. And these guys were experts in this, and they had foliar companies. Next slide. And they'd always park right in front. This is uh, 10, 12 years ago, and there's 3.8 liters in a gallon. So you take 3.8 times this. Uh, so 3 and 2 is 6 in Minnesota and 0.8. So their gas over there was like $7.5 a gallon. And that's why they had little bitty cars and their economy was dictated. When we hit $8 a gallon here, there's gonna be a lot of businesses that are gonna have problems. Your, your truck driving is gonna get expensive. Next slide. Linda Coates, veterinarian, off the grid. Here, a uterine torsion, which has really increased in the last 55 years when I got out of vet school. A uterine torsion is where a nine month old calf will flip 180 degrees, either getting up or getting punched or, 
or if they don't have a lot of minerals, if they're a demineralized cow with less calcium, less magnesium, less potassium, they're just, they don't have tone, that, ur that uterus will flip. And you reach in about nine o'clock and there's a shelf. And you go over here and here's this calf laying on his back. You poke him in the eye and he's alive. Huh. Well, that's where Dr. Burnap and Dr. Detloff would take and reach in and Dr. Fetch and you'd get that thing going. And you get that thing in. And then you go, <laughs> didn't work. About the third time it would flip. Now, if you're a 92 pound female, then you have to put chains on the leg. And I made it a rod, a detorsion rod. It had a little, little hole, uh, hole on it. I had Lloyd Rotering meld me a little hole, then I put a crochet hook here. So you go the leg, leg, and you go here, and you turn it. And then you would flip the calf. She's on the other side of the equator. All of her torsions are clockwise. Very interesting. Next slide. Now, when I left practice, a third of my calvings in these CAFOs are torsions. They have really increased because we've demineralized the cow because we're feeding corn silage, corn silage, corn silage, corn gluten. And if you really want to screw the mess up, you buy distillers because all the sides, the herbicide, insecticide, glyphosate, which is a side, is in the germ and it's concentrated in the distillers. And you are loading cows with things that are going to really screw up the immune system. These CAFOs have sick cows. Next slide. Oh, she, this, is her, this is her place out there. Wonderful veterinarian. She was very, very organic and didn't know it. Next slide. That's her place with her solar. And that's, this, is a, this is a plant that they worm with. Can't remember the name of it. Move on. This is the typical parlor. Um, notice no sides uh, open. And uh, that's probably, if we counted here, this is probably a 50, 60 uh, in the pit uh, going into a milk house over here. This is typical. They don't spend a lot of money on their buildings over there. They don't have big capital investment. Next slide. This is a chicken coop. You know what this is? Comfrey. Comfrey, the plant comfrey. Comfrey, if, if I would get a calf with a broken bone, broken leg, and I'd get them in February, March, in a 50 stall barn, and they had fall calving, and so the calf pens are full. This is before hutches and uh, that full, and oh, we got this maternity pen. Man, and we got three of them to freshen. Let's put a gate, you get a 10 foot gate and divide that maternity pen in half, and we'll give that 1500 pound Holstein this, this over here, and we're gonna put four calves in there. Yeah, that's what we'll do. So that 1500 pound cow has a calf, and she gets up and she steps, and, and the calf always lays with the front legs out. Boom, compound commuted fracture. Just bang. The paradigm was is to put a cast on it. In three weeks, you'd take the cast off because the swelling is down, and you put a new cast on, and it was six to eight weeks to heal the bone. Comfrey speeds up osteoclasts out of your bone marrow and your sternum and heals bones faster. Anybody that's going to have hip surgery, knee surgery, you need to get on Comfrey. And we have little two ounce bottles. And the first place I ever tried that out on was Joe Gladowski. And he had about a 300 pound calf that stuck its, it was in the bullpen. And you know, the bullpens had a little bar and you could get your leg under there. And this calf's black Holstein calf just put it and broke it right off. And I put cast on and you put a wire inside so you can saw it off. It's an OB wire and it cuts. And I took it off in three weeks because I was going to Australia and the next day, and I was prepared to put on another cast. Boy, that thing really healed. It goes through a pre-callus, pro-callus, it goes through five stages to heal a bone. And I said to Joe, I said, 
man, he said, when I got there, he said, man, that calf's running around really good. And I thought, ooh. And I said to Joe, I said, I don't think I'm going to put a cast on this. And I called Dr. Tom and said, I'm leaving tomorrow. And if I told Joe that if this goes south, he's supposed to call you. Would you take care of it for me? I never put a second cast on after I started using Comfrey. Comfrey heals bones, heals bones. So, and there's three to 4% calcium in this. This is their source of calcium for these chickens. And they'll pick it, they'll pick it right out. That's on Phyllis's farm, our dealer over there. She's way ahead of the curve, next slide. Here is a thymic swirl. See this one, this really stands out. That means the adrenal gland, the thyroid gland, the pituitary gland are all working. Next slide. Here, this is in my book. See this colic? Here's the eyes. When you get a colic up here, you'll have a mad bull. When you get a colic down here, you got a gentle animal. Watch them. And if you get, this isn't a perfect circle. If you get a bull with a strung out one, he's got abnormal sperm. You can tell what the sperm is like on a bull. So if you've got a colic up here with a, a kind of a different colic, he's got poor sperm and he wants to kill you. And the younger generation I had a problem with because they, when we got into the AI world, I had a whole generation of farm boys that had never seen a bull. And then when the herds got bigger, and Carl, you can attest to this, when the herds got bigger, they had to get a cleanup bull as AI became less effective. You know what the first service conception is on these big, big dairy herds? 20%, and that's with hormones. First service conception is terrible. And that's because they're not feeding grass and hay. And so, anyway, uh, and I would go down the line, uh, you know, I would see a bull, I'd tell him, uh, but that cowlick, these are low line, these are low line Angus. Next slide. And they are gentle. Here we go. Guess who owns these bull calves? There's 60 some bull calves in here and this is a house cow. You know who owns them? McDonald's. They got, they got 5.5 million cows over there. It was only five, peop five million people, so they export all their beef and their milk with New Zealand and New Zealand and Australia that Fonterra controls. They export 97% of the milk from those two companies, countries on the world market, and they have all these bull calves. And if you put in every one of these is a non-castrated bull, and he will stay that way. They take some about. 14, 15 months to get them to 1,200, 1,250. They butcher them, they take hanging sides, put them on a refrigerated truck and it goes to the United States. And a lot of the meat you're eating at McDonald's are grass-fed bull calves in New Zealand. Pasture after pasture of them. Now the problem is, if this animal goes lame and has an injury or gets a little respiratory, this is the one that's trying to ride here, and so he hurts the leg on a cow. If you take a bull out and put it in a different pen and treat it, and you put it back in, they'll kill him. You don't put them back in. So they always got a reserve pen. This one had pneumonia. This one had a bad foot. This one, we don't know what happened, but he got better. Uh, and they just shine. Next slide. Here is a bottle brush tree. Very pretty, the bottle, the brushes aren't on it, but next slide. My farm, my farm is like uh, senior moment, downtown, come here. They do farm lending and they're all over. They're all over and they would come to my meetings. Next slide. I'm at the first organic conference by Fonterra when were you there, honey? The first time? Yeah, it, with Fonterra. Oh, that's Eight years ago. Oh, more than, more than that. that. That was before Megan bought. Um, 
and they're so hungry for information over there that they're really good crowds. Next slide. Here's another farm meeting. Uh, next slide. Here I'm showing them how to read the hair, uh, doing a lot of stuff. This is Paul Pedersen. He milks 400 cows. And I had a meeting in his place. And I get there early and he said, I got to show you my corn silage. I thought, oh, no. Oh, he's in the corn silage. So we get on his Honda four-wheeler and we go out. And here's this little patch, about eight acres of corn. This is my corn silage. And I said, how many cows you milk? 440. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's good. You're not overdoing the corn silage. <laughs> he grew it one year and quit. <laughs> Next slide. Here's a typical one. This is a loafing barn. They milk in another barn. Next slide. This is a typical pasture. Here's narrow leaf plantain that comes early. But there are so many forbs. There's something purple blooming, something yellow blooming. There's a big broad leaf. Uh, here's a, that's a dock. Uh, their pastures are just, just like a, a garden salad. And they're thick. Next slide. Here I'm out in. This is going to be grazed now, the next day. I'm out looking at all these different things. Go back one, honey. There. Do you know how much, how much biomass there is there? I mean, that's tonnage. And, and they, they, they got many, many pasture mixes. Now, we've come a long ways, haven't we, Bob, with uh, Elbert Lee seed, prairie seed. Our pastures, they have what's called a diverse mix now. There's, I think, 23 different plants in it, including plantain and chicory. Um, so our seed companies have taken a really good look. And they're, you've got a diverse mix, I'm sure, John, haven't you, in your pasture? You just don't put in clover or uh, orchard grass anymore. You put in a whole plethora. You give them a diet. And we've come a long ways in that area. <laughs> Next slide. And this is storage. You don't see any silos. You don't see any silos or any trenches. This is how they do it. And they don't need that much. This is on South Island. And it's about a third of the way down. So it's very, still very, very warm. It's kind of North Island has kind of got San Diego weather. Um, next one. This is his corn silage. He is so proud of that little patch. Yep. Next slide. This is a lineback. This is a lineback. For some reason, linebacks are very popular in New York. They're a, a breed, um, and they're, they're not a Holstein or a Frasian. They're linebacks, and uh, they're kind of dual purpose. They're very hardy, um, the high test. Organic, organic milk, they, uh, people, they love fat and they love protein, because cheese and butter are two profit items. And so instead of getting, um, they say if you have a pail of Holstein milk and you don't want it to sour, you know how they kept milk from souring back in the 1800s, early 1900s, a silver dollar. Colloidal silver kills bacteria. How many of you have a silver generator? You do, you do. Yeah, you can thank Joan for that. <laughs> in New Zealand, everybody's got a silver generator. It's $98. It takes silver wire and you hook electricity up and you put salt water and it diffuses silver ions. And silver ion kills bacteria, gram positives, and gram negatives. Every spacecraft that we have that goes up in orbit where somebody's going to stay in orbit has a silver generator going into their drinking water so they don't get up there and they got, oh, we got E. coli in here. We got to bring them down. They all can't, they all, they're, they're, <laughs> it stinks in there. And anyway, uh, but anyway, silver is, uh, the silver generators are really something over there. Next slide. Now, in, in New Zealand, you have the Maori. The Maori are descendants of Polynesia. And they have tattoos. She's really tattooed. What was her name? Smith, wasn't it? 
This is, this is the spiff. The left arm is the mother's. It's, it's a history of the mother. The right arm is a history of the father. And it'll go down the leg. And everybody is tattooed over there. And that's the Maori. And they were the original Aborigines there. Now in Australia, they were the, they weren't Polynesian. They came out of China and they were black and they had the wide face with a huge nose. They were, they were really quite primitive, very primitive, the Aborigine. And they were persecuted, terrible, terrible. When after the homo, our, our Caucasians went over there. So we had a farm meeting there. Next slide. And he liked black. Just look at how that hair coat shines. That hair coat shines. And see these lines? That means they're getting plenty of these, plenty of energy. These are happy lines, they're called. Look at all the herbs over there. Next slide. Here's really happy lines. We don't need to throw a lot of grain or soybean meal at that cow. They don't feed soybeans in the Netherlands or, or New Zealand. Next slide. Uh, bi biodiverse pasture. I just couldn't get over their pastures. Just couldn't get over it. Next slide. Yeah. Here's a, here's a uh, this isn't a narrow leaf plantain. This is the plantain we have here. And this is how the, the seed goes up. Next slide. You notice I'm not looking at any cornfields over there. They just don't exist. There's no soybean fields. They feed the cow grass. <laughs> Somebody came up with that idea over there years ago. Next slide. Here's a cow patty. Two days old. The microbes have already started tearing this apart. You'll see one in Holland where the dung beetles they don't have many dung beetles down here. They aren't indigenous, but they've got um, the microbiome is just loaded with organisms to digest the organic matter. Or you can take a chicken. A lot of the Amish uh, with a 50 cow herd will put a chicken coop on wheels and they'll put 40 to 50 heavy birds in them and they lay a, they lay a board down and they sprinkle a little grain, but that for a parasite egg to reproduce, it has to stay in 50% moisture at 50 degrees. So today is Thursday. The cattle are in this paddock today. The egg has to turn into a larva, and there's L1, L2, L3 stage, and it has to stay wet and it has to stay warm. So on Saturday, we're gonna put a chicken mobile in here and these aren't soupy anymore, they got some body to them, and it might have a little grain in it from the way we feed cattle and that, and a chicken will come along and she'll spread this all out and it'll desiccate and it'll dry out and look at, and it'll temperature drop. And the Amish use chicken mobiles. Well, Kay Weimer does this. No, she doesn't do it. Yours, yours are housed. You, you just got organic eggs. But if you wanna have parasite control, Put a chicken mobile out there, and then you sell farm fresh eggs with orange, orange yolks. Next slide. There, there's dung beetles. That's 48 hour old dung, uh, that's the dung beetles. Just tearing that apart. When I was in Holland, it was, the two guys were looking at it, they were peering over this. And I thought, boy, they're really entranced with that. Oh, there's a different, there's three kinds of dung beetles. Oh, there's a so-and-so. He's a roller. You know, this is a, this is a, there was a roller and a tumbler, and one of them buries it, you know, and I thought, you guys got these named? <laughs> I mean, they were watching their dung beetles. And, but that's parasite control there, folks. Plus, that's speeding up the carbon cycle because you're getting that manure down where all the microbes are. Next slide. Here's a chicken mobile. Here's a chicken mobile. Next slide. There, he's got it pretty steep, but they can crawl up and out of that. At night, they, they uh, close that up. 
They do have a problem with opossums. Opossums see New Zealand, it's all marsupials. There's no mammals. But somehow a ship came and there had been at least two opossums years, 50 years ago, and they have no predators. Next slide. Next slide. That's, here's, uh, they all feed milk, no milk replacer. It's all milk, and this is on a 400 cow herd. They fill this with milk, high cell count milk, or just plain milk, and they, they nurse on these. Uh, next slide. That's called a milk bar. Another, another parlor. I believe this is on the Smith Farm. Next slide. They have the same type of electrical distribution that we have in America. It's called the open delta system and that everything is grounded and that is a, the wrong way to do it because all of, any animal facility that's been built in the last 30 years, anything that will conduct electricity, whether it's the metal stalls, whether it's the re-rod in the concrete, whether it's the vacuum pump, whether it's the milking machine, uh, anything that will conduct electricity, if it's a metal building, metal roof, metal sides, it all has to be bonded together. And the bigger, it's called an equipotential plane. And the bigger the equipotential plane, the lower the ohm's resistance. Now, we don't have the four-wire system like they have in Holland, where they bring two wires out, and you take it off, and they bring two wires back with the excess. Nothing's grounded in Holland. That was decided when Tesla was the first one to energize Niagara Falls for New York City. Nikolai Tesla was so ahead of his time. I went through the Tesla Museum in Croatia when we went on a boat trip up the Danube, wasn't it? Very interesting museum. This guy is, they still have it. Nobody's been able to repeat ball lightning like he did on Pikes Peak. He could create ball lightning in his lab on the top of, and nobody's been able to do it since. And he wanted this four wire system. They said, we're going to take it out and we're going to put a neutral to bring it back. Well, the neutral was way too small, so they said, well, no, we're going to ground it. Every pole is grounded, every meter is grounded, and we're gonna use the earth as a return. And here's, here is the substation, okay? Here is a big dairy setup. Here is sandy soil that's dry. But here's a crick. So that doesn't follow the poles back, that follows heavy organic wet soil. So it's following this crick. Well, then this crick goes over here, and Joel Kabuna's got a dairy operation here and it's low and it's wet, so he's got ground currents coming into his equipotential plane. Now the ohms resistance in this dry soil might be six ohms and his buildings are two ohms. Where is that current going to go? It's going to go right into his dairy operation. You never have, here's the North Pole, here's a dairy facility, you never put your transformer south of your dairy facility because all transformers talk to the magnetic North Pole. And the North Pole is moving, you realize. The North Pole has moved considerably into Russia. The poles switch, the geology, geologists say about every 85,000 years, the poles switch. When that happens, everybody that I had moved the transformer over here, north of the facility is gonna be in deep trouble because that's going to talk to the South Pole. So anyway, this current issue was, that's what I'm spending my time on. He went and redid his whole thing. Next slide. His plate warmer, or his plate cooler. Uh, that's a real source of DC current. You can see all his, this is his mother's story, and this is his dad's story. Very proud of it, very proud of it. Next slide. And there he's got, this is all grounded. This is all grounded. And he took, and I'll show you where he grounded it. Go ahead, next slide. Oh, it's out of ways. Uh, this, oh, here, see this? Every pole has got metal on, that's for the opossums. They wanna crawl up and sit up there and short out the deal. Next slide. 
Here's a substation. Now, the reason we didn't go with Nikolai Tesla's four-wire system, Edison wanted, the light bulb guy wanted to use the ground. You know who won the battle? The guy with the money by the name of George Westinghouse. After New York was energized, from now on, we're going to ground all the poles in America. Big mistake. About eight years ago, the state of Michigan had a bill come up that we want to get away from a grounded grid. And it got killed by corporate America. Next slide. Here's where he grounded that. This is his pasture. This is his pasture. Next slide. See these capacitors? They're all over America. This line is too small. If this is a 65, 75 kilovolt line and they build a bunch of houses or new dairies or a CAFO went in and you need 85 kilovolts at peak demand and this is only 75, these are electron sinks full of fluid that increase the kilovolts of this line. So they can get 85,000 at three o'clock in the afternoon and everybody's working and milking and what happens at three o'clock in the morning when this line's overloaded? These put electricity in the ground, big time. You do not want to have a dairy operation within a quarter mile of those capacitors. This happened to Tom and Bill Waldera. Independents used to get fed off the substation right out north of town here, where Donnie Wegman out there. That fed Independence and Arcadia. As Ashley grew, they said, Independence, we, don't, we can't supply you. We need all this electricity for Arcadia. You're going to get fed off a, a line up at Whitehall, and it's going to come along Highway Q in an old 1937 aluminum line. And so they slapped a bunch of these up on that line. I did Waldera's work. They were my biggest account. Excellent dairy. Excellent dairy. They fed a lot, a lot of hay and haylage. It was not a sick dairy. All of a sudden, that farm turned south. Every Wednesday morning, I'd go there and pregnancy check. I mean, they were milking 500 cows, and I would pregnancy check 40 to 80 cows every Wednesday morning, depending on which group. And they're in lockups, and they got so, they were just crazy. They were just thrashing around, and they were like sticking your hand in a well pipe. And I, this is early on in my education, and I said, something's happening here. And a cow would bump her leg going out of the parlor, boom, and she'd get a little blood clot. Oh, okay, we'll put her, yeah, and that's no problem. <laughs> you go back next week and that thing blew up. She's got 104 temperature. Well, we'll put her on antibiotics. 10 days later, she's dead. Electricity screws up the immune system. DC current. When AC current is grounded, it becomes DC current and that kills cattle. DC current affects all mammals. Hear me? So, next slide. Next slide. Everybody's got pigs. Everybody's got pigs over there. And they had a big fat pig. Because they don't have corn, they don't have Crisco or, or uh, any uh, plant fat. So what do they cook with? Lard. You know what my first dinner pail was in 1948 when I went to a little one-room country school in Grand Meadow? It was a five-pound Hormel lard can. That was my dinner pail. My mother cooked with lard. Next slide. Here's how big they are. They're lardy hogs. That's the hog in New Zealand. Next slide. Here's, uh, here's the Maori. This whole town was Maori-based. It's a tourist area. Next slide. Um, this is in Auckland. That was a Maori village. Next slide. Uh, we're back there. I don't know how this got in there. Keep going, honey. This is on a river or a lake. When I went, when Megan knew that she was going to buy us out, uh, we took Megan and Marcia over to New Zealand and to meet Phyllis because they're a sizable account. Uh, next slide. And that was just card in there. Oh, you know what this is? This whole field, kale, 
K-A-L-E, kale. It's a tremendous forage. And they use that in the wintertime. Next slide. Oh, this is another meeting. Next slide. Here's more kale. Hmm? For their animals or for humans? Animals. That's forage. Highly mineralized. <laughs> Highly mineralized. Next slide. Here's what they do with it. Okay? This was a field of kale. And they lay these here. And they run a hot wire. And every day they'll open up two bales. 400 cows would eat two or three. Next day they move the hot wire. They fed it during the winter. That was their winter. Kale, they fed them. They aren't hauling it any place. They aren't storing it. They don't need big equipment. They don't need silos. They don't need... Uh, now we got these Fen tractors that are $560,000 for packing. The CAFOs all got one of these now. They got to pack the haylage. $560,000 to pack haylage. We're doing something wrong here. Next slide. This is on a calf. This is reading the hair. See that yellow? That calf, is, when it milks, is going to have high, high butter fat. You can, there's so much about reading the hair. It's in my book. I didn't bring any of my books tonight. Next slide. Here's an escutcheon. This one really shows out. She's going to start real slow on butter fat. It starts right at the bottom of the vulva. Now, if you get a vulva that has coarse, coarse, coarse hair, a lot of hair, you're going to have coarse, coarse, coarse hair on the udder, and that is masculinity, and that animal will not give you a lot of milk. You can watch that. But see how this comes down? She starts, and she's probably two months into lactation, and all of a sudden her butter fat just takes off, and it goes way over on the thigh. And that means she's going to, she's going to, in the latter stages of lactation, have a lot of butter fat. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, here's uh, at the neck, the thymic swirl. That's, that's really working, that endocrine system. Next slide. Here's a real narrow one. Here's a real narrow one. No, I don't have any here. Next slide. Go back then, Joan. If you get butterfly wings on the udder, that's protein. When I got back and I was working in, with putting my school on here at Arcadia, I had a client by Melrose, a lady that had brown Swiss, 40 brown Swiss. Uh, a biological farmer. They weren't organic, but they did everything. They could have been b organic if they'd have done the paperwork, but they were just happy, a little German couple with two boys, and, and, uh, and she knew these cows. And so I was there one night treating a milk fever, I think, and uh, I said, I'm just going to read the hair for protein as I walk out of the barn. And I went down and whenever I'd see butterfly wings, and I got all done, I said, you got three cows in here with a high protein. That one, that one, that one. She said, well, that's three of the four. I said, I missed one. No, she's a dry cow. She's not in here. <laughs> she, she said, how'd you know that? And so uh, that was uh, Virox. Anyway, I had a client of mine that had 20 heifers for sale. And the organic people hate to sell heifers because they're going to go into a CAFO and they aren't going to live more than two years. And he came to my school, had one of his sons come to my school. He said, I got 20 heifers for sale. Why don't you come and read them and tell me the 10 high butterfat ones and the 10 that aren't? And he said, I'll get, I only want to sell 10. I, he had 20. So I went and I told him, and I said, now get these 10 out of here. Just say you only got, and so he did sell them on my recommendation. Next slide. Another typical parlor, open air, not a big building. Next slide. Uh, there's a fence. That's the reason I took that. No hedge, fence. This is quite hilly. Now, what's happened is that there were 80 million sheep in 
New Zealand, there's now 37 million because they've gone up to five and a half million cows. Five and a half million cows. Next slide. We're gonna, now this has got all kinds of flowers in it. You can see I fell in love with their pastures. I, next slide. Here's merino sheep. Merino sheep are on South Island and they only grow in a certain area. If they take a merino sheep with this, this is a merino sheep and it just, oh boy. You'll go to sleep with this, Henry, if you just sit by it. <laughs> Pass that around. And if they move them to a North Island, that changes to just good old wool. Next slide. This is a, this is a kiwi. This is a kiwi. On your shirt, Jerry. On my shirt, yeah, that's, next slide. Here's more sheep. A lot of sheep. I can't fire her, just be patient, okay? <laughs> uh, I, I married well. Next slide. Uh, this just shows, this is in the South Island. Next slide. More merino sheep. You see they, where they can't put fences up, they turn the sheep out. There's still a lot of sheep there. Next slide. They do put urea on their pastures, which is a source of nitrogen, but the cows get loose as a goose. And with the advent of yonis over there, they've really backed off on the urea. And they've concentrated more on the grass. Next slide. Next slide. That's urea. Next slide. Here's urea. That's kind of fell in disfavor. We went through urea in the 60s. When I came to Arcadia, Dr. Johnson was selling bags of urea to put on your, your hay fields to raise the protein. But it makes them all look like they got yonis, the diarrhea. Next slide, it's not good for the gut. Here is a manuka tree, a manuka bush. The manuka has honey. And it's a medically, the University of Queensland at Christ Church has done extensive research on Manuka honey. Go Google it, M-A-N-U-K-A. I, I did have a bottle and I don't know where it went or an empty one, but that is treasured. It's very high dollar. And they don't use a lot of sides or chemicals over there, so they have a plethora of bees. Next slide. I think you're going to see there's another Manuka. There, it grows all over. More of it on the South Island and the North Island. Okay, move on. Here is what you see all over, blue beehives. Blue beehives, man, do they raise honey in New Zealand. And at every table, they'll have either brown cane sugar with a little spoon, or they'll have manuka honey. Um, next slide. Okay, new program. New Zealand has a, quite a few A2, A2 cows. And I'll talk on that when we get done with this PowerPoint. But this is a plant that China owns because you cannot own land in New Zealand unless you are a citizen. And we should look at that seriously at the United States. We should not be letting Africa buy up our land or buy up, or uh, not Africa, China or other countries uh, buy land in the United States. This is being built. Next slide. Now this is the second trip we're there and they're doubling this plant. So they made a deal with some owners of this land. We want your dried powdered milk from A2 cows. From A2 cows because the cows that came from Europe had a lot of A2 in them, and I'll go into that in a little bit. They are now building, they have built two more plants. This is a conventional milk plant, they've built two more. Uh, they had a plant with 30 farmers and another plant with 16, and they're going organic A2, A2. China is buying all they can get a hold of. Next slide. This is the first plant that's done, and they're adding on down below. Huge facility. Next slide. 
This is an opossum that got. And you know, when you travel, you always find something really neat. So I bought my wife an opossum pelt. I, I just love her so much, not to her. <laughs> but my point is, is they take opossum, which has overrun the country. I wanted the skull, but that one got pancaked. They take merino wool and opossum, and they make clothing, and it's high dollar. And it, I wore this at our last, at our last presentation. And uh, I bought Joan the opossum, and she bought me this. Send the opossum around, too, Oh, gosh, I don't want anybody to touch that. <laughs> Here, Lucy, Carl. <laughs> but it's a neat industry. Yeah, you did. Yep. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Move on. Here's another, another thing they have. These are the big red, red deer with the big stag horns. They have got herds and herds and herds of them, and that all goes to Germany and France. If you go to Germany and get venison, it's going to be uh, raised in New Zealand. And those are not merino sheep. They're in a different area. Those are just regular sheep. Next slide. There's some more deer, quite skittish, quite skittish. Next slide. There is a typical rack. You can bet we got hunters going over there from America to shoot those. Uh, but that's called a stag, the red deer. Next slide. There's some more biggies. It's quite an industry over there. Are any of them wild? Hmm? Pardon? Are any of them wild? Um, yeah, they are. They are, yeah. Yep. Well, they're fenced in, but they're wild. Yeah, but there are wild ones that aren't fenced in, like our, yeah, like our deer, too. The big farms are... They grow timber as a crop. They'll clear cut, and then they'll reseed the whole thing. They'll reseed. Uh, a lot of pine grown there. Um, they're, they're, they do not... Soil erosion is rampant when they clear cut. They take everything. Next slide. That's a typical... North Island uh, terrain, South Island, or South Island this is, North Island is flat. Next slide. That's a pig. <laughs> this is in that Maori village. Next slide. That's a sheep. So, next slide. This is a rainforest. Beautiful rainforest. A lot of different trees. Next slide. Another rainforest. This this is all pine, that all goes to China. It all goes to China. Next slide. Here's uh, uh, Mount Hood, the glacier. Next slide. We did a little sightseeing. Here's a, a uh, kiwi. They're totally nocturnal. Totally nocturnal. Next slide. And this is by Queensland where uh, Lord of the Rings was. And uh, the girls took a little... Tour, wildlife tour. Next one, Marcia and Megan went. Um, this is Marcia. She's a full-fledged psychiatrist. This is Phyllis. There's my full-fledged rock, my wife that may help me through life. And uh, we're having a brunch. And that was our squeaky little chauffeur. Next slide. Oh, they have a. They have a duck over there. It's black and white. Next slide. And this is along the ocean. Next slide. Next slide. They have a lot of kelp over there. They feed kelp a lot. Penguins. Next slide. There's mullion. Mullion is the same all the, all the world over. There's two things that never differ wherever you go, and that's the buzzard. The buzzard looks wherever you go. The buzzard's got those gray wings, and they fly like this. Buzzards are the same all over, and so is a million. This is a huge expectorant. We tincture this. This has, has organic molecules. It's for respiratory that dilate the bronchioles. So if you're breathing, you can breathe easier. It brings blood supply to the increases that it cause vasodilation of the 
blood vessels, and it's an expectorant that brings up phlegm on the modal cilia. And uh, if you're in a room and I'll dry this, uh, we've got it uh, on my farm, and I usually, they're easy to get a whole bunch of mullion. 20 plants like that, and you got a big bag full. And I dry it, and I'll shake it up and crunch it, and I will start sneezing. And my eyes will run. My nose runs to both sleeves, keep them busy, you know. <laughs> anyway, that's mullion the world over. Next slide. More mullion. More sheep. Oh, we took a train ride. That was kind of pretty. Next slide. That's the last one. Okay. We're, we need to switch, Jewel. Uh, anyway, let's, we're going to talk quickly on A2A2. What happened is that they hypothesize that on the top of the Mediterranean, there's a tectonic plate and there's volcanic activity there. And in AD 79, that's when Mont Vesuvius erupted and buried the city of Pompeii. It's quite a tourist reaction, or attraction. They're really doing a lot of digging there now. I get the archaeology magazine and they're discovering stuff all the time in Pompeii. This whole city was engulfed. 5,000 years before that, it's hypothesized that there was volcanic activity at the top of the Mediterranean that put Central and Eastern Europe in a cloud of dust for a number of years. You did not see the sun, and when you didn't see the sun, you had a lack of vitamin D. And there was a mutation in the protein of the cow's milk. And this was known about that there's a pro, a casein is protein, and that's what we make cheese out of. And you've heard in eighth grade science that protein is made of amino acids. Well, casein has 209 amino acids. Number 67, they know where the C's, the O's, the H's are. They know the chemicals and they have them all named. So number 67 was called proline, P-R-O-L-I-N-E. And for some reason, it, the elements got rearranged. The nitrogen went over here and the sulfur went over here and the oxygen. So it's now lysine. And the bond with number 66 is a weak bond. See, carbon is a carbon-based molecule that we make all, our, all of our proteins, all of our carbohydrates is on a carbon molecule. It's the only element on the elemental chart that'll hook onto itself with a double bond. That's why we're a carbon-based molecule. Now, when this breaks off from pasteurization or heating or digestion in your stomach, it breaks off and isoleucine number 66 drags six more little amino acids with it. And it's a very tiny chunk of protein that goes into your bloodstream and it causes an inflammatory reaction. It, it's an inflammatory reaction. And women, sheep, goats are A2A2. You still have proline there. The Amish saw this way back. Fonterra, who exports all the milk out of New Zealand and Australia, hired a scientist at Queensland, at the University of Christ, at, uh, Christ Church, to look into this. So he, now the cattle in Africa, this didn't affect. They're A2A2. The zebu and the Brahmas and any South African animal is A2. They found that if you were born in, or if you moved out and didn't drink A1 milk, and Africa had a lower incidence of heart problems, schizophrenia, and type 1 diabetes. Africa's generation are lower. And this doctor did an epidemiological study. And if you live in Africa and come to the United States, your chances of getting heart problems and diabetes is higher because you're drinking A1 milk here. And they hired this scientist and he did a, these studies and he thought, this is bad stuff. And so he wrote a book. It's called The Devil in the, Bo in the Meeting. The Devil. There we go. Yeah. And then next we'll go to Holland. Okay. That's in there. Okay, A2, A2. Um, you need a disclaimer. 
next one. Next slide. You're in the right spot. Yeah. The bovine originated in the steeps of Russia is where it came out of. This is a uh, auroch, A-U-R-O-U-C-H. This is the last one that they know of, and it was in, I believe, 1700. This is in a museum in Denmark. Next slide. Okay, uh, 1627, the last recorded in Poland, and that's Bos primogenis. Okay, next slide. And then they had two species, and that's Bos taurus, and that's all the European cattle. Next slide. That's Africa. Zebus and Brahmas, they're all A2 because they didn't sit under this dust cloud above the, this is Africa. Next slide. Okay, here is Pompeii. And up here is a couple islands. The island of Guernsey, the island of Jersey, and they're kind of in Western Europe, and this gas cloud didn't get as intense here, so Jerseys and Ayrshires and Guernseys have less A1. They stayed A2. Your Holsteins, your Brown Swiss, your Shorthorns, your Durham, all mutated, okay? Next slide. The high, and this is what I just said, the hypothesis is this weak bond, okay? between five and 10,000 years ago. Next slide. Um, and here's 67, which is proline and isoleucine. This switched to histidine because of no vitamin D. Next slide. And this little chunk, this is called beta casomorphine 7, and this is addictive. This is addictive, and this causes inflammatory in all of the glands, your pituitary gland, your adrenal gland, your thyroid gland, and what happens, and the Amish noticed this way back, is that the Amish all nurse. They don't buy Infomil. They all nurse, and they nurse for 10 to 12 months. It's a form of birth control. And when little Amos got cow's milk, because everybody milked Holsteins, within 24 hours, Amos would have one. He was just a miserable little kid. He was fussing. And you go to the doctor, and, oh, I think he's getting teeth or... Uh, he's colicky, or um, or he's allergic to milk. Way over half of our milk allergies are not lactose problem. It's A1 milk. And the Amish got onto that, and they started using goat milk, because goat milk <coughs> is A2, A2. And this is the reason why the Dutch built a goat milk cheese plant in Lancaster, Wisconsin, for Europe, they want A2 cheese in Europe. And they came in and they said, we want, about 10 years ago, we want 200 flocks of 200, 200 goats. And the goat only has two udders. And they got a little milking machine. And who jumped on it? The Amish. When they said that, I thought, wow, that's never going to happen. Well, Cologne, Iowa is one huge, and there's Amish all over. The Amish are expanding like you can't believe, folks, because they're a big part of our business. And anyway, as soon as they... Uh, if you go to the doctor, he's going to say, well, he's allergic to milk. The medical profession has got their head buried, and they don't. And the veterinary profession, even, in our milk companies, oh, it's a, it's a pyramid. Because they, what they did at first, they patented it, in, and it's a DNA test. Well, the patent never held up. Germany contested it, and you can't patent Mother Nature. So move on. We've got to keep going here. Next slide. Fonterra hired Keith Woodford, Okay. Heart disease, diabetes, and schizophrenia are up in the societies that drink A1 milk. End of conversation. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Keith Woodford. He said, I want this to be known. He wrote this book, and he said, I will, Fonterra wanted to hush it up. Because 97% of the milk in New Zealand and Australia still has a lot of A1 in it. It just happened, and the reason... It ended up in New Zealand, as you see, in 1788, the British government took all their criminals, 800 of them, and sent them to Sydney, Australia. 
and they sent a few cows along, and England is over here, so they had some brown cows there. Then a few years later, they sent another 800 to Perth. Sydney is on the way on the coast, Perth is way up here. And so they had two colonies, and they sent, was it 1,600? We Googled it, honey. 16,000. 16,000 prisoners over a period of years got sent to Australia. So the ones that got sent to New Zealand had more brown cows and they had more A2A2. And so, next slide. This just shows the preference by drinking more. Finland and Sweden, their high incidence is higher. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, from uh, heart disease. The organic world has jumped on, and this is, a, this is a genetic test. In Australia, any of you farmers, remember the old all-flex tagger that would cut a little bitty piece of skin out of the ear to put a tag in? It was a little about the size of a lead pencil. That's what they do in New Zealand. They'll take that little tagger and thump, and then you need, in America, they take the tail hairs, the long tail hairs, and you stand back and you take a pliers and you pull them up and you need the root hair. And you need DNA for this. And the test runs, at, you know, it's $12. Now it's, I believe, $14. And it's in Davis, California. The number I give out is in Lincoln, Nebraska. And you send the test there. And if you got an A2A2 cow, this is available in the United States now. All the box stores have got A2 milk. High V, Safeway, West Coast is loaded with it. This is a 1,400 cow dairy at Crescent City, California that I sent a gentleman out to clear up their stray voltage from Strem. I have a genius up there that I send all over. If I can't figure out stray voltage, he's smarter than me, he can. That's 8% butter fat, it's not homogenized. You put that on breakfast food and it's to die for. And that's a big organic herd. They graze the tidal flats of the ocean on the California-Oregon border. And uh, I do their vet work over the phone. Yeah. When I got back from New Zealand, I took a bottle, uh, we, got a, we bought a liter of A2 milk and I bought that book and I went down to Organic Valley because Organic Valley, we were supplying Stonyfield yogurt with our milk for the organic yogurt and they were 25% of Organic Valley's business. And I thought all they have to do in New Zealand is call up Stonyfield yogurt and say, we've got A2, A2 milk for you. How about A2, A2 yogurt? and we would have been vulnerable. And I said, I want cattle to be polled, and I want cattle to be A2, A2, and I want you to do a John Kennedy deal and set a goal for Organic Valley. In 10 years, we're gonna have all polled cattle and all A2, A2 cattle. When I would put marketing meetings on, all of these, when I would go to California and that, they'd have all their big buyers at the box store, and we called it our dog and pony show. We'd take them out to a really nice farm and show them how the calves and this and that. And I would get this question every time. Why do you dehorn cattle? Mother Nature put those horns on. And that was hard to defend. And they would argue with me, you know. And it's still a hot point with the, with the young educated female. You don't argue with them. I, I got three daughters and I don't argue with them. Yeah. I, well, there's four of them I don't argue with in our family. But anyway. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, Holland. Whole new story. Organic Valley started the organic movement. California started it. Out east, Pennsylvania started it. And they all said we want. In 88, dairy world was a mess at the bank. You, you, we know that. You know, it was... People couldn't pay their bills. It was a tragedy. And, the, and so we wanted value added. And these seven farmers in Lafarge said, let's have some organic. And I don't think we should use antibiotics. Okay, no antibiotics. I don't think we should use hormones. 
okay? I don't think we should use any th synthesized molecule in our fields. No sides, no, no uh, fancy fertilizer, okay? We want to go back to grandpa. And so they started these. In 2000, year 2000, the USDA said, okay, okay, you've got a plan and you've got a plan, you've got a plan, we're going to standardize this in the United States. Europe had a plan where you could be organic if you took and read the label and it says do not slaughter for 24 hours, well, you triple it. You triple it and then it's organic. And so Europe is going along. All Europe had the organic where you could use every drug, any hormone, any chemical if you tripled the withholding time. We set the bar up here. And so the USDA said, we're gonna standardize it. And so they came out with the regulations, and guess what? They copied Europe. And Organic Valley and uh, a little, little company at, uh, uh, in northern Petaluma, California, and said, hey, any Tom, Dick, and Harry can be organic. We can't charge extra for this. And that was before computers, and it was a letter-writing campaign and a phone call campaign. And, in 1999 and 2000, and the USDA got deluged. They just got blown over like, ooh, we touched a nerve. So they said, we're gonna pick a 15, or you pick a 15 member board and you tell us what you want. George Seaman, the CEO of Organic Valley, who was a genius, way ahead of his time, he thinks way out here, he was on the board. And so we set up the standards. Holland, could sell extra milk because they've got quite a few cows and only 17 million people and nobody would buy their organic milk. They sold us some milk and wanted us to send it to China because we had better standards. Well, no, they still produced it under the European method. We can't do that. So they said to Jim Wiederberg, my boss, how do you do it over there? And he said, we've always done it. You need to have Doc Detloff come over and put some meetings on. So here I go. I went over there with uh, Tom Moss Scholar, Dan. Dan, just a genius young guy. And this is a pasture. Next slide. Here is where I had five meetings. And I also went to Utrecht, which is where the vet school was, and I put a meeting on there the last day. Holland, is, Holland and Brussels and Belgium were in 1939, Hitler took them over in one night. And the people in Belgium, Brussels, and uh, Holland starved during World War II. They came in and they took every livestock, every pig, every chicken to feed their war machine. And it shows epidemiologically they've gone back to all of the infants born from 40 to 46 have a very short life expectancy because they did not have any food. They did not have, it was, it was terrible. In fact, we had a meeting up here and here's France and the evening we were sitting around visiting and there was quite a bunch and I said, well, it was kind of nice to see some French and Germans there. And it was like I dropped a bomb. There were no Germans there. They don't come into this country. Oh, they hate the Germans to this day. Yeah, two of my brothers died or what? They just, they were like, ooh, I, I got rid of that word. Next slide. Here's how it looks like. This is, um, I, he's got a daughter in vet school. That's all they went and talked to the vet school. Grass, 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 grass. Next slide. Drainage ditches. They used to have windmills to pump the water out of these drainage ditches. Now they have uh, hydroelectric. The windmills are for decoration. But these, most of these farms, and uh, go back to that other slide, honey, to the map. Okay, this area down in here has all been added. And it's, they, they've drain, they're draining more and more as you go. And, and I'll show you what they got in this area that they've drained. Next, go ahead now. Here's a typical native cow. 
black and red with a white face. They're crossed with like three different species. There's some Frasian in them. Um, they're about 900 to 1100. And this is a, this is a pasture here. Next slide. There's, uh, this is below Amsterdam. That's the Rhine River. And uh, just look at the Forbes in that pasture. Next slide. And that's what, and they come, they walk right up to you. There's no wild cattle in, in either New Zealand or Holland. Next slide. Here's, here's a defunct D. Lavelle grain deal where they, they came out with a D. Lavelle, had a neck chain with a number, and you would set that, and she'd put her head in there, and you'd get two, three, four, five pounds of grain, whatever you had. Uh, if it was corn, or if it was ground corn and oats, it would come down. And there was none of them working because they were getting all of their, their corn and that was coming from Ukraine and Romania. And they had dry weather and um, they just couldn't get it. So, and they would feed one kilo. That's 2.2 pounds. That's all they fed when they did feed. But when I was there, nobody fed grain anymore. It was an all grass society. And you'll see every place you go, they're very humane. Here's a De Lavelle back rubber. All concrete, all concrete. Um, they've, got the, they've got the four wire system over there. No, they don't. This is the, this is the four wire system. They don't have that stray voltage here. Next slide. All open air, D. Lavelle feeder. Next slide. Here's a brush deal. Brushing. Their hair coats are just beautiful over there. When you feed grass, you've got a hair coat, and, a, and a, it's really something. Next slide. Here's another D. Lavelle deal. Next slide. They don't have housing over there. Oh, they love their birds from North Africa. They will go through your pastures in the spring, and there's a black and white bird that nests in pastures and hay fields, and they will put a white stake up, and then they put a yellow ribbon around, and you get paid. You get paid from the Dutch government if you don't cut the hay in here because there's a nest in here. And they hire college students to just walk through these pastures and these, and oh, there's a nest. And you get a, quite a sum of monies. And then uh, these are all, all for birds out of North Africa. And they really like their birds. It was just kind of a phobia. Next slide. Haymaking stuff. Haymaking. This is a big high dollar one. No silos. See, they're under bags. They have more summer than we have here. Next slide. Am I on your way, Hank? No, uh, a lot of pits, a lot of pits, and they got a knife in their manure. They can't put it on top of the soil. Next slide. Here's uh, some grass. Just, they don't, alfalfa is not an issue over there. They don't grow alfalfa. Next slide. Here's bales. Next slide. I like to dig a hole. Whenever I get on a farm, when you get a farm and you don't put any negatives on it and you get a biodiverse grass and you get your cations in line on the Elbrecht system with calcium, magnesium, potassium, and that lined out with a pH of 6.5, that will grow you a healthy plant. It will grow a healthy tree. And soil should be like chocolate cake. And I would go out and I always wanted a spade. And this guy was a professor at Utrecht. He was an uh, animal health guy. He rode with me. And uh, you dig a hole and there's just earthworms. Earthworms. And it just, you pick up a clump and it's just, it's just live. Little red bugs and gray bugs. And it's chocolate cake. And you could take a 10 gallon can of water and put in that hole into it. <laughs> that organic soil doesn't get dry. That doesn't get dry. Next slide. 
Here is a project he had with a little high school where each student got a few square feet and they come out and grow this stuff. Very humanitarian guy. Uh, but see how dead level that is? Next slide. Uh, here I'm talking and this cow walks up to me. What are you talking about today? I mean, just stood there and one of them one time I felt something and she was looking on my, I should have changed pants, I guess, that day. But anyway, those, and these are Frasians. Boy, they, they're not Holsteins. These are Frasians. They're smaller. She's probably 1100, 9 to 1100. Next slide. Uh, these are bigger ones. These are bigger ones. Next slide. Here is an old, this is on a number of farms in that this raises up and they put long stemmed dry hay in here. And that's the cover. And that's been around that method for years. Long stemmed uh, grassy hay is more digestible than your dynamite. When you get 24, 26% protein in this alfalfa, I mean, that really is a lot of protein, but they get loose on that. And that doesn't do the best for the gut. Next slide. There's another one, different farm. Next slide. Now here's hedgerows. They really got into the hedgerows. This plant, it goes along here and these are alders and the deer will, or the cattle will eat on these alders. Next slide. Here is the beginning of a hedgerow. This is about 20 feet and it goes and they've got all kinds of perennials in here and they have got trees planted in here. This just went in and this, I brought this idea back. There was a very smart genius that was older than me that uh, wrote a lot of books and he was, always spoke at all the conventions, Jerry Bernetti. And he died young of cancer, but he talked about herbal hedgerows, how we need herbal hedgerows. Next slide. Here's a dung, here's another dung beetles. Here, uh, we're, I'm speaking in the, in the, all the Dutch people, they could understand English. I couldn't understand a word they said. I was embarrassed that I didn't know two languages. Here's a herbal hedgerow. I have two of these that are gonna be in America in the next month. It's been my project. Here's a untreated post. Here are alders. I'm going to use um, um, black raspberries and the raspberry leaf black, red raspberries are very full of medicinals. Next slide. Now they don't have deer and they can get by with this, this here that we can't here. Here's willows. Willows are full of medicinals. That's aspirin, acetosalicylic acid is in willows. Next slide. And here's the farm. I, I was on five farms and four of them had these hedgerows coming out. Here's one, here's one. And then they fill that with perennials, with perennials. They'll have echinacea, they'll have, uh, and they'll, they'll put stuff in here for, for bees and they put stuff in here for butterflies. And this is a, uh, this, this whole thing here is like a sanctuary. Next slide. Here's three of them. This one they just put in. And then the willows that grow inside, they take and cut them and throw them out so they can't, if they can't read. You can see how they, they graze these that they can get at and these here they're gonna throw over. And then about three times a year, they lay the wire down and there's early perennials. I noticed when I was mowing lawn this morning, my, um, my bergamot is blooming. Bergamot is in the Monarda family and bergamot, bergamot is aspirin. It lowers the temperature. We take Megan tinctures bergamot. And that if you've got a headache or a cow with pain, you give them a willow tincture, a, berg, a bergamot, and then you usually use arnica and that. And so and then in the fall, when you have your late perennials blooming, then you lay your wire down again and you let them graze it. And so Joel Winnis in Lewis Valley is putting one in, and I got one going in at Colfax. Isn't that on Bob's old farm? Pardon? Is that on Bob's old farm? Yeah. Yeah, on your old farm. Yep. 
I'm going to deliver some stuff to him. And uh, they're pretty excited about it. And what was kind of interesting, when I'd get on these farms, I wouldn't be there 10 minutes, and they'd say, I want to show you my hedgerow. My wife put up this birdhouse. And if you ever go, you know what earthing is to get rid of a free radical? Earthing is when you, when you take in a synthesized molecule made in a lab that wasn't through photosynthesis. It doesn't have the frequency of life in it. And that's why all these drugs have side effects because Mother Nature didn't make them. They're made in the lab. When you photosynthesize, they have a frequency and energy, the two things in a double bond. And so um, the aspirin that Bayer makes looks the same as the aspirin in a willow tree, except it does not have the frequency of life. And so when you give 240 grain aspirin to a cow three day, times a day for six days, she will have black manure from an abomasal ulcer. And I would see that consistently in practice. And so, um, but you, there's a perfect place for an earthing chair. On the bottom, you see our, our soil has a negative charge. That's why Elbrecht puts the positives in the right proportion to get a good plant. But on the bottom of your foot, Megan can tell you, there's a meridian called K1. And K1, you take your shoes and socks off, and if you put down a fine-grained rock that an Indian would make an arrowhead out of, that's called a paramagnetic rock. And there's diamagnetic rocks, are large molecules, or large, like limestone, it's diamagnetic, uh, granite, basalt, nice, they're all paramagnetic. And you will pick up a negative charge from Mother Earth on your bare feet, and you will just be in La La Land, and it, and it gets rid of the, the, the free radical. And it's earthing, Google earthing. Google, it's big. It's, and then Google, uh, um, what's the other thing? I'll think of it. Next slide. But these are fun. Uh, we're, we've got a couple hundred plants going into both of those. We've got bee balm. We've got plants that have in, feed insects that are predatory insects on the negative ones, like the soybean aphid. You can get an insect that'll feed on them. And we've got insects. We've got pollinators for bees. Um, it's a whole sanctuary of things on the farm. I'm kind of excited about it. Here's the home of ro robots, Lily. Lily is still the best robot, bar none. D. Lavelle came out. D. Lavelle put a variable speed motor right in the middle of their robot that set up electromagnetic field. And anything, anytime an electromagnetic field hits anything that will conduct electricity, like the metal of a robot or the metal in the barn, it sets up a DC current. There's re-rod in this concrete. There's re-rod in this concrete. This metal, all of this metal that you see here will pick up a negative charge, a DC current. When you bury AC, you get DC, and you'll have current flow on this. You never, ever want a metal water. It'll pick up ground currents. You want poly or plastic. Next slide. And you never run an electric fence over the water either. Solar panels. They're going green. Next slide. Uh, four of the five farms sold milk right on their farm. You go up there and uh, took your, take your jug, slide it in there. It's like going through a car wash. Credit card, or well, I, I don't know if it's a credit card, but, and they would sell milk. Raw milk is legal. Raw, raw milk is legal. We're the only country that's worried about pasteurizing. And that was Louis Pasteur, and that came from the whiskey industry when they would buy cattle and put them around the distilleries and they fed them the mash from the barley or whatever they, and they all got TB. And then they had to have uh, cows had to be checked for TB, and we've had to pasteurize because that we got off on the wrong foot with our milk. Over there, they sell raw milk by the gallon on every farm, four or five farms. Next one, honey. This is uh, sweeping the manure into the lagoon. It just kind of automatically goes around like a vacuum cleaner. Um, next slide. Here's an interesting farm. You ever, anybody ever hear of biodynamic farms? 
Biodynamic farms don't use fertilizer. They instill energies. Um, next slide. See what this is? Hung in every barn. It's holly and it prevents ringworm. If you get ringworm, put that in there, it clears it up. You know what the Amish and Mennonite taught me when I got into Organic Valley? In Indiana and in Ohio, I'd be in the, around this farm, 50 cows, there's a goat. He's, he's sure getting into things. Next farm, you got a goat, yep. What do you got a stupid goat for? They don't have ringworm. If you have a goat around, and you don't get a billy because they stink, you get a nanny. Really? No, I never heard. I called up Dr. Guy. I said, have you seen a lot of goats in these farms? Yeah, he said, everybody's got a goat for ringworm. Do you get taught that in vet school? I said, no, I never, got, never heard of it until I got on the Mennonites. It works. The most, what's my statement? I think. <laughs> Personal observation is the most reliable source of truth. Personal observation is the most reliable source of truth. We had a big 400 cow herd by Madison, a star herd. They were doing everything right, and they had Steve, and they milked about 300, right on the edge of Madison. Well, it's in just a little bit north of Sun Prairie, and it was a showcase. If we wanted to take a, eight box stores on a trip, I'd go down there, and one day, I, Steve calls and he says, I've got a ringworm all over. I've never had it. And I said, get yourself a goat. What? I said, get yourself a goat, but don't get a billy goat. Well, that's a new, and he hung up on me. <laughs> a year later, I see him at the annual meeting down in La Crosse, and he came up and he said, I thought you flipped your lid. But he said, I got a goat and he said within four weeks, the ringworm was gone. And he said that goat just, he was in the manger. He said, what a headache. Yeah, I said, they are, but the Mennonites put up with him. Anyway, about two years later, he calls me. He said, you know what? That goat died two months ago, and I got ringworm back. I said, go get another goat. He said, yeah. and so this is holly. Now, we've got holly in southeast U.S., North Carolina, we got a pool in North Carolina, and I wonder if that holly doesn't work, but every barn had holly in it, in Holland. Next slide. Here's uh, for bedding. Here's for bedding, to, to grind up the bedding. They, uh, they don't have any heat in their buildings. Next slide. Um, just shows the D. Lavelle deal. Next slide. Here we are, biodynamic. What biodynamic does, and this was developed by a genius named Rudolf Steiner, put out a book in the 18, late 1800s, and he would take horns, and he would take cattle manure or horse manure in these horns, and he would bury them on the equinox on the first day of fall. He'd bury them, he'd leave them all winter, he'd take, dig them up, and he would take this, and it turns into dirt. You got to have. You can't put it on a glyphosated cornfield. You got to have have land that's never had any negatives on it. Okay, and that will turn into dirt. And then there's granite dust, and then there's yarrow. There's about ten. They're called 501, 500 remedies. Five hundred is manure. Five hundred one is granite dust. That's paramagnetic. And then you take and you put them in a, a vat of water, like a blue barrel of water, that horn, and you stir it 64 times one way and 64 times the other way. And that's what they fertilize their crops with. Now there's another way you can get it, and I had a set of them in the back of our yard. They're called free flow forms, and they're like a clover leaf, and they were cement, and the water would come down and it would go here, and it would go here, and it would go here, and then out. And that made structured water. Now, structured water has hit America in the last 
five years, and that's when you take and run water through a vortex. And you take a vortex by quartz crystals, and that water will go through, and it's got a, it doesn't go through like this, it goes through this way and it moves around. And if you got a piece of wood in there, that wood will always point the same way as it's going. And what it takes is that water is a normally a 10-sided tetrahedron. H and two O's, and it's 10-sided. It enlarges the tetrahedron, so water has different characteristics. Where it's used a lot is in the produce industry. When you water with structured water, you get, it, it's unbelievable, you get more nutrient density, more nutrient density. If you're going to use foliar spray, you want structured water. We have a structured water device in our house. All of our tinctures are made with structured water and it raised the ergs. Ergs is energy raised per gram of soil and it raised the ergs in our tincture. It's, it's unbelievable what structured water is. But anyway, that's what you're doing with this biodynamic farmer. This guy was really an interesting cat. Next slide, he used shoes. This is their breed. Remember I showed you those first slides, the black and the brown ones? You don't dehorn. You don't dehorn. They have a relationship almost with every cow. These people are really into life. Next slide. And there's the brown and white one. Very, very tame. Next slide. With the horns on. Next slide. Big belly on the left side. Apple on the left. Pear on the right. That's a grass-fed cow. Wide chest. When you feed calves uh, grain and corn and not grass, you get a narrow slab-sided. Next one. Here's their house. Just him and her. Here's their house. Here's their cheese-making facility. And here's their 55, 60 cows, all biodynamic spends nothing on fertilizer. He does pay attention to his soil. Next slide. That's his wife. Quite a dynamic woman. She takes all of their milk. Next slide. And makes it into cheese. And they are wheels. Those are wheels. She sells most of it in the United States. Next slide. There's her aging room. And she would go down and she'd have a little cheese slicer. Here, I have that. And I got a, a caraway cheese that was just unbelievable. Try this one. Try that one. Uh, direct marketing. Uh, next slide. But biodynamic. Now, Michael Fields Institute, which is a philanthropist that owns some farms down in that uh, Elkhart Lake area where the racetrack is there, and they're biodynamic. And they were on the Organic Valley truck. And he had the flow forms. All of the water, wastewater coming out of the milk house went in the lagoon. And that was structured water in there. And that he used with the 501s, the fives, he buried the horns. And uh, healthy cattle. Next slide now. Here's the new and the old. This is the old. These are non-functional, they're for tourists. This is the new hydroelectric that they have to keep pumping the water out of those canals because it's way below sea level. High, high organic matter. CEC's Bob in the 30s. I mean, it is really heavy soil. And you know what they put on? Lime, lime, lime. <coughs> they love lime. Next slide. Uh, here's a thatched roof. You see a lot of those and there's the new roof. Next slide. This is a wildlife area that they have just drained and they've got deer in there. They're draining more of the ocean. Next slide. And you overlook it and you can see there's water out here, but they're, they're reclaiming land here. And they've got some cattle in here and some, some deer with big horns, stags. Next slide. Uh, another picture of it. Uh, another picture of it. I kind of got wild of this one. Okay, World War II. This was all water. Wherever you see this, 
a plane went down. An Allied plane was shot down and they marked all the spots and they're sacred. And they've drained this now and there's a plane under there. They did not move it. And you see these in this one area down in the southern and towards the ocean. Kind of sobering. And that's a reminder that the Germans did this. They did not like the Germans. They did not like. That law, what is that? I said, that's English. <laughs> a little white lie doesn't hurt once in a while, you know. <laughs> Next slide. Here's, uh, we spent an afternoon in Amsterdam. 1371, this building is. If you ever want to get an education in life with the young folks, go to Amsterdam. Next slide. Old, old buildings. Bicycles, bicycles, bicycles. Everybody rode a bike. Rode a bike. Everybody rode a bike. Next slide. This is downtown Amsterdam. Next slide. Okay, I saw three of these. And I asked uh, Dan, I said, what is that kind of a deal? He said, that's a wheelchair car. That's a wheelchair car. He said, the back of this flops down. And this guy's in a wheelchair, and he just drives his wheelchair in there and closes it up, and he drives around town in his wheelchair car. Yeah, why didn't we think of that? Huh? <laughs> you know how many people we saw in, on a bus trip? We just went to Detroit and went through the Ford Museum and saw all of the saw all of the uh, tulips, 6.5 million tulips in one farm. I was the youngest guy there. <laughs> they, I, could have sold, I could have sold these to these people. <laughs> she laughs. Next slide. I think we're about done. We are. We are. Okay. Any questions? If you have grandkids, get them on A2, A2 milk if the mother doesn't nurse. This soybeans and this A1 milk. These Amish. Um, I had a guy that worked on a farm and he got some cows. And the cows were A2, A2. And then he moved up and added some cows. And they had a child and she nursed it. And he'd heard my talk. And when the child got weaned, he brought some Holstein milk in, and he had a reaction within 24 hours. He had a rash, uh, miserable, cried, colicky, diarrhea. What in the world's wrong? Called me, and I said, you got some A2 cows in that barn. He had some, he had some Frisians that this guy had been breeding, A2, A2. And I said, go get some goat milk. He had a goat dairy close, or goats. Put a uh, little Amos on goat milk, and find some, and he tested his herd, and about a third of them were A2A2. So he'd bring in milk from the A2A2 cow to give to, and then he had a second child, okay? One day he thought, I'm just gonna try something. So he brought in a gallon of Holstein milk that was A1. And he said those two kids, within 24 hours, were absolutely miserable. He said, it, and it's very, it's very evident when, you, when people quit nursing that are A2 and bring in milk or infamil or, you know, they have a reaction. And so, and this Dr. Woodford, I mean, he, that's why he wrote the book and he said, we should be drinking A2, A2 milk. Now, when I got back and I went to Organic Valley, I took that liter of milk and a book, and I put it on upper middle management desk, and I said, we better read this. This is real. I got a real ho-hum reaction. Real ho-hum. You know who jumped on it? The Amish and the Mennonites and the farmers. You've been breeding A2 how long, John? 15, 20 years. Since I got back from... You told me to. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in the organic and the natural have all gone to A2, A2. Now that sale barn up at uh, Lithy, they're selling, they're selling cattle, uh, dairy cattle. 
their A2 cows are bringing in 100 to 200 dollars more. And I've got all these homesteaders, how America has changed. I never dreamt that I would be putting meetings on and setting up new dealers. We were in southeast West Virginia, where a orthodontist gal, same age as Megan, wants to be a dealer of Dr. Paul's. There were 50 people at the meeting. 30 of them were homesteaders. And the homesteaders around the metro areas are really, really growing. They're both educated. One of them is making over $100,000 in the computer world or in the medical world or insurance world. And the other one's educated and they, have, they, they bought 35 acres out here. And the first thing they'll get is 30 chickens. And they don't know the chickens need calcium. You know, and they don't know that you can't let a chicken run around because a hawk's going to get them. And so then they'll get a pig because all the pigs in the country are owned by packing plants. Farmers don't own pigs anymore. You know, and so our whole society has changed and they don't want to buy anything that's manufactured that Mother Nature didn't have. And they're smart. I just had a, two calls today from homesteaders. And they use homeopathy, they use tinctures, they use, they use Dr. Paul's stuff. I never thought that that would be, how many meetings have we put on for Megan though it's been homesteaders? It's just been a lot of them. And the Amish and Mennonite, they, they never did drink the nectar of corporate America. So things are changing though. And what's well, the positive thing that I see in America and I observed this at Organic Valley, I worked for them 16, 17 years, and I still do some work for them, is that I'd go down there once a month to do something, and here's a new young gal. She's a scuba diver. She's got a master's in botany. Here's a young gal. And these young gals in America are focused. And we've done it with our food. We've got so many sides in so many manufactured molecules that are estrogen mimickers or estrogen blockers. How many young kids do you see that are fat and have large breasts? I've got really large breasts because the food, when I was younger, I didn't eat the, thank goodness she's got me eating better, but we've, and, uh, we've got a whole nation of strong, powerful women. There's 25 vet schools in the US and three in Canada and one in Puerto Rico, 82% of all the students in vet school are young, powerful women, smart as a whip. And they're not for sale. They're not for sale. The good old boy, the good old boy deal where I'll take care of you, you take care of me is going to be over politically and in industry. I mean, the lady in New Zealand was a, uh, she just decided not to be prime minister anymore. They loved her. When we get women in politics and in industry, things are going to change. And I see it happening. Yeah. Any questions? I, I just got a comment because we were in the Netherlands and in where their wildlife are. The one highway we went on, they had fences on both sides of the main highway. And then there was an overpass so the animals could go back and forth over the roads without getting killed. Yeah. Beautiful country. Oh, yeah. And New Zealand, there's no litter. And the food is so good, tasty. You don't see an obese New Zealander. You do not see an obese New Zealander. Netherlands yeah, Netherlands either. Yeah, I really enjoyed those. And uh, these people that embrace Mother Nature and that, uh, they're not hippies. I mean, these people are, th are thinkers and we're going through a change. And it's, I hope it's enough. You know, they wrote a couple of psychologists wrote a book when I was, got on the Blair Bank Board. It was called uh, The Bell Curve. You've heard of that book? Where they said, the, when's, when's the optimum time for a young girl to get pregnant? At 17 on prom night, okay? The, the, do, the bottom dwellers reproduce. What's happening with these young educated people? They get their degree, they get their masters, 
they maybe get a PhD, get, and then they decide, I'm 32 now, I better get married. And they can't get them pregnant. Megan, when she got out of acupuncture school, went to the Isthmus Clinic in downtown Madison. There were seven acupuncturists there. And when you came in to get acupuncture, they'd say, what are you eating? Well, I drink Diet Coke and, and popcorn and they don't know anything about food, these younger people. It's all preserved, isn't that? And Megan would say, here's what you're going to eat, or I don't want to talk to you. And they had been to Mayo Clinic, they'd had a tipped uterus, they'd been on hormones, they'd spent $60,000 and they can't get pregnant. Well, you go on kelp and you start eating right and then we'll see what we can do. Yeah, the young educated girl has trouble getting pregnant. It's getting worse. You got anything you want to say? A lot of young people don't want kids. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like... China is in trouble. Yeah. China is in trouble because uh, I belong to a think tank, and one of them is 93 years old, and he was a consultant in China, and they said, we're going to have one child. He said, you won't work. You can't perpetuate a society when two people have one child. And he didn't want girl babies. Too many of them died of childbirth. Uh-huh. They wanted boys. Now, China is building A2 plants because they want to, they say now you can have two. They're out of workers. That's why they're looking at Taiwan. Taiwan's got workers. Taiwan didn't go to the one child person, or one per, per couple. Uh, and now they're ramping it up. And they want to save every baby now. And China is on A2. Uh, Germany, uh, your European countries, they're all going A2. And we got thrown under the bus by DFA, AMPI, uh, Mid-America. All your dairy co-ops have A1 milk, and they say, oh, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a pyramid. There's no science behind it. There's sciences deep behind it. This happens. And the quicker we get on this and get our head out of the sand, the better off we'll be for our youth. Yeah. You're going to see A2 milk in the younger, educated group explode. You can now get it. At, and I think all the box stores in La Crosse have it. It's about a. Honey, your half hour's up. My half hour's up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. They have no reason, they have no idea. It's, <laughs> it's, got, it's got to be a pheromone or a molecule. Because now, okay, forest bathing, this is a new thing too. Forest bathing, Japan is two little islands full of trees and a lot of people, and they have anxiety, they have high blood pressure, they're, they're, just, they're just all, and they will write you a prescription. You go sit in the woods for two hours. Leave your phone at home, do earthing, and you sit in the woods, and it lowers your blood pressure. It lowers your cholesterol, and Japan is writing up prescriptions. Two hours of forest bathing, three times a week. Come back and see me. And this is earthing. If you're going to do earthing, go out in the woods. The woods has a whole plethora of organic molecules that are coming out. Yeah, earthing and... Forest bathing. There's a new book just came out. I got it. I read it. It's in my basement. Forest bathing. It's on its way. Okay, I'll let you go home. <laughs> Thank you.